Shalom. I'm Muddle Balliston, and this is Our Messiah is Jewish. In this season four, we've been talking about Messianic prophecy. We've considered some giants of Messianic prophecy, Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9, and particularly Isaiah 53. These are mammoth verses. If we had three times as many hours, we could take more time to, to detail these. Um, as I did in uh, some of the previous episodes, I did recommend to you uh, this book called Hamashiach, uh, a lot of my study over the years was with Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, and uh, for years he presented lessons um, in manuscript form that I've saved all these years. About two or three years ago, he came out with this book, which are a lot of those uh, manuscripts about the Messianic prophecies now gathered into book form, along with appendices. And I spoke to the folks here at GLC, God's Learning Channel, and these are going to be in the bookstore. And so we'd encourage you to order this book, HaMashiach, which is the Hebrew word for the Messiah. HaMashiach, the Messiah. That's the simple title of the book. It's all in Hebrew. It, that's the title is in Hebrew. The actual book itself, by the way, is in English. So don't concern yourself. Order the book. You don't have to speak a word of Hebrew in order to benefit from the book. It's a Bible study book written by my good friend, my dear friend, Dr. Arnold Furchtenbaum, who is a renowned scholar for two generations, a Jewish believer in Jesus, uh, born in Europe during the Holocaust. An incredible story. Time, that's a, a story for another day. So what we're going to do here is uh, talk about two of the passages that Dr. Furchtenbaum actually outlines, and these are things I learned from him some 30 years ago, and I'm so glad that he presented here in this book form to share with the world. But here are two passages that are messianic, that are well known, and things that uh, uh, this series would be incomplete if we didn't discuss. So we're going to be discussing Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Once again, the book of Micah, the minor prophet Micah, Chapter 5, verse 2. Just a, a quick word here about major versus minor prophets. Um, in your English Bibles, there is a division, the, the major prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Daniel, Ezekiel. Those are the four major prophets. Th they're called major prophets because their books are longer. <clears throat> their books are no more important than some of the minor prophets like uh, Zechariah or Haggai or Habakkuk, and all those other names that are difficult to pronounce. Uh, why are those called minor prophets? Simply and only because their books are shorter. You would not believe the importance of the book of Hosea to prophecy. Most people are completely unaware of that. But the uh, book of Hosea is very important. But it's shorter, so it's minor. Micah is one of the minor prophets, but he has something very major to say here in chapter 5, because while in one of the earlier episodes, we had looked at Isaiah chapter 7, talking about the virgin birth, had shown why it was a virgin birth. Here in chapter 5 of Micah, it goes beyond uh, the, the, the circumstances of the birth of the Messiah to hear talk about the location. Now, when you come across prophetic sorts of utterances, uh, one way to understand whether they are true or not is to ask a very simple question. Have they come true? <laughs> um, as a kid, I'd go through the, the supermarket line. In, I grew up in, in New York City. I grew up in Brooklyn and uh, spent the first uh, 25 years of my life in Brooklyn, which is one of the boroughs of New York City. And in every one of the supermarkets, as you went through the checkout line, Invariably, there were these, these rags, these, these journals, the Inquir National Enquirer, and other of the, these yellow journalism sorts of But They were basically gossip papers. What gossip websites do today, uh, the, the, these National Enquirer, the Star, all of these things were the papers of that day. And they all said, in very tiny print, usually on the editorial page, the contents of this newspaper are not designed to be factual, but rather they're designed to be entertainment. <laughs> and that's what their lawyers made them put in because half the stories were made up. But invariably, in late December, there was an issue that said, 
you know, the predictions of so-and-so for, you know, 1972, what's going to happen? And uh, some woman would give her predictions and everyone would, would buy these issues and eagerly expect these things to happen. And by the end of the year, when none of it happened, it didn't matter because everyone had thrown away their issue for the previous year. And she had a brand new set of predictions. Well, friends, that's often what happens. That doesn't only happen in the secular world, but very sadly, some of you know that it happens in, amongst believing circles as well. There are folks who subscribe to a sensational sort of uh, method of ministry, which is always dangling carrots in front of people, always dangling little trinkets of prophecy. Um, and when those prophecies don't actually come true, the prophecies have already been long forgotten because a whole new set of sensational promises um, have been offered. And uh, that is a very sad thing because it keeps people perpetually immature. It doesn't allow people to grow in the, the meat of the word. It keeps people um, on the edge of their seats about nonsense. And it's a very sad thing to see. The scripture sometimes get abandoned and people follow after individuals who only tickle their ears. Uh, and if I say anything more about that, I'll get into trouble. But that's part of the Christian scene today. And I would simply encourage the viewers of GLC here. GLC is committed to some serious Bible teaching, and that's why I'm here. So, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Here's the passage. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephratah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. Yet from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. This is well understood, correctly understood, as a messianic prophecy in reference to the birthplace of the Messiah. It refers to the fact that the Messiah will be born in a specific location. It's very specific because not only does it say Bethlehem, but it says Bethlehem Ephratah. Let me explain. <clears throat> in Israel, there are actually two towns named Bethlehem. And at the time this was written, in Micah's day, those Bethlehems were about of equal size. There was a Bethlehem up in the Galilee area, up in the Galil, the Galilee area. But there was another Bethlehem about 10 miles or so, 7 miles <clears throat> south of Jerusalem. And that was Bethlehem Ephratah. At that time, both towns were well known. They weren't large, but they were known to be Bethlehem. Today, the situation has, of course, changed. Bethlehem Ephratah only, ex I'm sorry, Bethlehem of the Galilee only exists in ruins, stone ruins. It's pretty much disappeared, whereas Bethlehem Ephratah, the one down south of Jerusalem, of course, is world famous today because it turns out to be the birthplace of Jesus. Bethlehem, which in Hebrew, the, the meaning of the name is, is the, how it's pronounced, is Beit Lechem. Beit Lechem means house of bread. Beit or Bayit is the Hebrew word for house. Beit is the construct form. Bayit is house, just as a noun, house. And when you say Beit Lechem, you're saying the house of bread. That's the construct form of the, of the word there. Lechem is the word for bread. Man does not live by Lechem alone. Um, and so uh, this term of Beit Lechem means that it was the house of bread. Why was, Jerusalem, why was Bethlehem, Ephratah, called the house of bread? Because it was in an area that grew grain. All around the area of Bethlehem, there was grain being grown, and that grain would eventually be used for bread. And so here it says in verse 2, But as for you, Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephratah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. 
it was amongst the smaller towns of Judah at that time. Not today, at that time it was. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. From you, repeat that, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. It's a lot in that single sentence. First of all, the Messiah, the one who is going to be ruler here, will go forth from Bethlehem Ephrata, from Bethlehem south of Jerusalem. How do we know that this is the Mashiach? How do we know that this is the Messiah? Because of the next phrase. He will go forth from me to be, to be ruler in Israel. To be the ruler in Israel. To be the king. Ultimately, in Messiah Jesus, would the office of the Davidic king be fully realized? Ultimately, only in Messiah Jesus would the full extent of the throne of David, of David, be realized. And so this is the messianic throne, promised to the house of David. That's why Bethlehem, Ifrata, is addressed here. This is their throne. This is their clan. It was promised to them. Notice that this Messiah will go forth for me. In other words, the Messiah does not amble along and do whatever he wants, but rather the Messiah is going forth with a purpose. He's going forth for me. Of course, the Lord God of Israel is the one speaking here. The Messiah is on a mission. The Messiah is not there for his own sake. He's not there to amble along and just not accomplish anything, but he's on a mission. And the mission of the Messiah is described in the book of Isaiah to bring the Jewish people back to God. Isaiah chapter 49, as we exposited in a previous episode. In Isaiah 49, the twofold mission of the Messiah was to bring the Jewish people back to God verses 5 and 6, and to bring the Gentiles into out of the darkness into the light of the Scriptures. And so that was the twofold task of the Messiah. And Jesus was the one who, who took up that task. So, as for you, Bethlehem Ephratah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. You're not a prominent big city at that time. From you... He will be born in Bethlehem. One will go forth for me. He has a mission to accomplish something for God. And he will be ruler in Israel. He will be the Messiah. Now it says, his goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. The Messiah will come from Bethlehem, but in a sense, his existence is way before Bethlehem. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. The Messiah had no beginning because the Messiah is the second person of the Godhead, the Son, the eternal Son, Messiah Jesus. That's a very simple truth that you need to grab a hold of. The eternal nature of the Son. No, Jesus is not a created being. He is part of the triunity of God, the threefold person. There are three persons as one God. You think you can understand that? Then you're better than every theologian. I know some fancy theologians. I've read their books. I'm not a scholar. Friends, I am not a scholar. I have glimpsed scholarship, and that ain't me. But I know how to access the work of the scholars and translate it into plain English for folks like you and I, because I'm just a plain guy from Brooklyn. And I need to have things explained simply. And very simply here, one of the basic truths is that the Messiah is from Endless days of eternity. He's part of the Godhead. Again, just as I alluded to, 
neither of us, neither you, the viewer, nor I, the speaker, we don't understand fully the nature of the triune God. Do you think you can explain the relationship of God the Father to God the Son? We, yes, we have an inkling here in the scripture. But you're trying to apply the mind of mankind, the things of heaven that cannot be understood by our mere mortal brains. So nice try, but ultimately we fail to do that. But what is very clear is what God wants us to know from this book. The goings forth of the Messiah Jesus are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Messiah has eternally existed. He is the self-existent one, existent one because he is part of the Godhead. He is one of the three persons with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And by the way, that's not something invented in the New Testament, but that's something that goes back into the pages of the Jewish Bible. Yes, the Trinity is taught in the Jewish Bible, Isaiah chapter 48, verse 16. Free bonus. But this, we can't do a program on that right now. Isaiah 48, 16, the Trinity, all three persons of the Trinity are seen in that passage. And so in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, you have the birthplace of the Messiah. Very important thing. Now, let's shift over to another messianic passage, without which this, this series, this uh, season four, would be incomplete. And that would be Psalm 22. In Psalm 22, we have the famous words that Jesus uttered from the cross. In Psalm 22, we recall the words of Jesus when he was there uh, hanging on the cross for you and for myself. And he said, very clearly, it's recorded in the gospel, um, gospel accounts. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So let me read to you from Psalm 22, this passage written around the year 950 B.C. 950 B.C., David writes these words under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's writing at God's command, and he's not completely sure what the words mean. Again, just as with the Isaiah 714 passage, there may be a sense in which this passage may have a double reference. It may have partially a reference to David's own experience in the wilderness while being chased by Saul. That's a possibility. But certainly it also has reference to the greater son of David, which is going to experience, he's going to experience something years in the future. So let's read the passage. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. O okay. oh my God, my God, I cry by day, but thou dost not answer, and by night, for I have no rest. We need to discuss this frankly. Throughout the earthly ministry of Jesus, Jesus would often pray, and he would refer to God the Father. And most often, in those passages, Jesus would address the Father as my Father. My Father is working, and now I am working. Most of the time, that is the phrase used, my Father, the Father. That is what, how Jesus refers to God the Father. In only one instance does Jesus personally say, my God. And that instance was on the cross. Why? We all understand as believers that no one forced Jesus to the cross, but he willingly went there 
to take upon himself the penalty for the sin that you and I commit. He volunteered for the mission, in essence. He willingly took upon himself the punishment for sin. The scripture says the wages of sin is death. But then in Romans it says, but praise be to God because we have a redeemer. We have someone who has voluntarily taken upon himself the punishment for our sin. The scriptures in Romans chapter 5 says that while you and I were yet sinners, Messiah Jesus died in our place. And praise God that he did. Otherwise, you and I would have no future and no hope. But he is our future. He is our hope. He took upon himself that sin. When he took upon himself the sin that I commit, the sin that you commit, the sin of all mankind, he was not being judged on the cross for his own sin. Because as the scripture says, he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. Jesus did not commit sin. And yet he went to the cross to be punished for the sins of others. That's what Isaiah 53 is saying. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was wounded for our transgressions. Do you see how all of Scripture is knit together around this common theme? It all fits together like that. So on the cross, as he's there willingly being executed for the sin that you have committed, the sin that I have committed, God becomes his judge. God becomes his executioner. All throughout his earthly sojourn, Messiah Jesus is in a relationship of fellowship with God the Father. Now understand, of course, he veils his humanity. At birth, he willingly takes on human flesh as a covering. He never relinquished his deity. He never gave up his deity. He was the God-man. But he veils himself in human flesh. He clothes himself in our flesh. That's why scripture can say that in all things he was tempted as we are. He's known all the temptation that is subject to our human flesh. And so he understands that. But he himself committed no sin. So, on the cross, he is no longer in a relationship of fellowship with God. But now God is his judge. God the Father is his executioner. And all of a sudden, the Lord Jesus is now in a judicial relationship with God the Father. God is judging him. And that's why he looks up and he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Those words all in Aramaic. Because at that point, the entire weight of all of the sin of the world, my sin, your sin, all came crushing down on him. Unimaginable. Words are foolish to try to explain this. I would be a fool to try to stand here and in human words try to explain the weight of the crushing sin that came upon Jesus. At that moment, the relationship of God the Father to God the Son was as judge. And that's why Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus goes on, and, and some of the passage here in Psalm 22 goes on to talk about the nature of Jesus on the cross. Look at with me, Psalm 22, verse 12. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me. As a ravening and roaring lion, I am poured out my flesh. 
uh, and poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. All of this is a physical description of the physical condition of Messiah Jesus hanging on the cross. My bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax melted within me. My strength is dried up like a, a piece of pottery. My tongue cleaves to my jaws. Thou dost lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers have encompassed me. That's the situation at the cross with the Roman soldiers. They pierced my hands and my feet. That's what the passage says. Pierced. Not some other translation that the rabbis offer. They've pierced my hands and my feet is what the Hebrew Bible predicted in the year 950 BC. I can count all of my bones. They look, they stare at me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. This Psalm 22 passage is a precise prophecy of what would happen to Messiah Jesus 950 years later. To every detail. The word of God is powerful. It pierces like a two-edged sword and helps us to understand the plan, the program of God. That's why we've talked about messianic prophecy in this fourth season of Our Messiah is Jewish. It's one of the classic lines to understand the reliability of God's word. Friends, God's word is reliable. We can stake our lives on the promises there. They are yea and amen. He's kept his promises in the past. We see him keeping them today. We understand that then in the future, he will go on to keep them. Study the scriptures. Once again, I encourage you to, to order from the GLC uh, store the, the Hamashiach book where Dr. Fuchtenbaum talks about these prophecies. It's been a joy sharing these messianic prophecies with you because together we are believers in Jesus the Messiah, the only hope for mankind, for Jew and Gentile alike. Shalom, shalom in the precious name of Messiah Jesus. Jesus. 